Well, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is like uh, one of the cool moments of my life um, to be able to, uh, to be here and, and uh, say a couple things to you all. So um, thank you all uh, for uh, what it means for you to be here uh, today, the last couple days. Um, thank you for the work that, that you are doing on behalf of kids and the people who serve them. Um, and thanks for being involved uh, in helping us um, build a community and a, and a set of professionals and a capacity uh, to carry forward uh, work that really matters uh, for those kids and the people that serve them. So thanks a lot for, uh, for all that. It's really cool uh, to, um, uh, to be able to uh, say a couple things uh, to you. Um, uh, when uh, Rebecca asked me to, to um, provide a couple of comments uh, and then, and then uh, introduce uh, Derek Little. Um, so I, I'll have very little uh, to say um, before uh, I introduce him, but uh, just a, a couple thoughts. Um, I, think, um, I think in the field now we're in this, we have this kind of, uh, kind of contradictory space. And we, in the next couple years, we've got to sort this out. And on the one hand, um, we, we are serving tons of kids um, across the country. Increasingly, we're serving kids in early education settings globally. And there's a sense um, in the public, there's a little bit of a sense in the field, that we built these systems and they may not actually be serving kids with, the, with all the kind of impact that we have and all the kind of hopes that we have for them. Okay, so we've got that on the one hand, right? And then on the other hand, I'd argue that Right now, in our field, there are more examples of stuff that we've developed, and I, mean, I don't mean stuff in a pejorative sense, I mean, I mean there are tools that we've developed collectively as a field that, um, that really do work uh, when, when we bring them out to the field and they're used with, with integrity and they're used with some, with some fidelity. We've got examples of curricula that work, we've got examples that we've been talking about here that work. Uh, we've, got, we've, got, we've even got examples of policies that work. Um, uh, and, and there's this strange disconnect between a field that has so many tools. It's so rich um, in, in terms of the kinds of things that we, uh, we know about and, and, and that we can uh, get into, into classrooms for kids. And the other side of this, which is Lots of places, lots of kids, not as much happening for those kids as we, as we really need to. And somehow, over the next several years, I think our challenge as a field is to put those two things together. And I think that's what you're doing here today. And uh, it's, it's very, very heartening. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, quite frankly, um, it gives me tremendous uh, hope and optimism uh, for where the field is going to see the kind of dedication uh, that, that you have the kind of ideas that are being generated uh, at this meeting and the kind of uh, commitment uh, to doing work that matters for kids um, that, that you've exemplified. So I think, we have, I think we have opportunities to actually get traction uh, on this problem of, of, of putting together um, this challenge of all these programs, all these kids really needing, really needing help uh, and, and figuring out what do we do with the, with the tools that are in our toolkit and how do we make sure they get used uh, in the right way. Um, a couple of years ago, I had, a, um, I had a, an opportunity, uh, it was actually my first trip to Austin. Uh, I had an opportunity to um, meet with um, a group that does policy work here in the state of Texas. Raise your hand, Texas. I don't know, how many people know raise your hand? We can raise our hand if we know raise your hand, Texas. <laughs> um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I, I really a, a tremendous amount of respect for, uh, for the kind of work that they're doing, both from early childhood all the way up through higher ed, because I think one of, the, just as, one of the challenges I think we face, actually, a little bit as a country um, uh, right now, and, and we're going to face uh, going forward, is what do we really mean by public education in this country? And I think Raise Your Hand Texas, um, it, certainly in the state of Texas, 
stood and stands for public education um, uh, for kids and, and for students and, and communities they serve. So um, I really felt like a, uh, it was a great opportunity for me to meet those, meet those people. And they were very interested in, in um, strengthening what they could do as a policy organization to strengthen policy for early education uh, in the state of Texas. So I had a, a chance to um, put together a brief um, about uh, uh, what we saw as the, as the key elements of, um, of a quality program for early education. And the, the, you know, those, those tools and those categories of tools are not gonna be, um, are, are not gonna be um, uh, uh, unfamiliar to people. You know, strong curricula that are developmentally aligned to where kids um, can be and need to be. Um, effective interactions with teachers. Um, data systems that provide not, not high stakes accountability, but information that help teachers improve uh, their work with kids and, and know where kids are and on the track. And an approach to this um, that builds a synthetic system from preschool all the way to third grade. You know, that, that, that when those four things are in place, we see really strong examples uh, it, it, and when they're in place, not just one year, not just two year, not in one, not just one thing, but all four things. When all four of those things are in place for a period of time, and people stay focused on those, and they're aligned, we see real progress for kids being made, whether it's at the state level or whether it's a lo at, at, a, at a local or district level. So we we put that together for um, for raise your hand, and that's that's actually on their uh, website if you're interested in snagging it. Um, but uh, as a consequence of some of that work, I got to meet, um, I got to meet Alan Cohen, who was doing work in Dallas uh, at, at the time. And uh, this was a time when, when that work was really starting to build up. There was also the, um, the work going on in San Antonio. Um, and Texas, you know, Texas has had a long history with, um, with early education in a variety of ways. And so um, it was exciting to begin to see that work uh, percolate at a at a uh, at a stronger level. So, um, uh, so it's been exciting to kind of come back um, and now uh, really be able to um, to kind of work more closely, particularly in Dallas, and to, and to be able to introduce Derek here in a moment, um, because I think um, you know again many of you come from places where this is happening, where we're seeing local folks come together in communities, whether it's a school district, whether it's a, whether it's a program, a Head Start program, um, whether sometimes it's a state, um, state like Louisiana I think is doing this and a few others, where um, there's a very clear set of objectives around um, instantiating quality um, and programs in ways that really matter for kids, um, where those elements of curriculum, interactions, um, data systems in P3 are threaded together, they're connected to higher education and producing a, a workforce that's aligned to those, they're connected to the kind of professional development investments that are being made in teachers and in the workforce, they're connected to credentialing, they're connected to the assessment systems, and when those things, as I said before, are, are coming together, we, we really do begin to see traction. And that, that's something that's a tremendous credit to those of you that are working in the field in those places and I think that's ultimately, those examples are what give me a lot of hope and optimism for bolting together this, this sense of, um, you know, we got a lot of kids um, that are being served and maybe, maybe we, uh, we need to do a little bit better by them. I think we got to um, approach this work in the next uh, couple years with a sense of urgency that we may not have had before um, because uh, there's a lot of scrutiny on the, on the work that we're doing. There's questions about whether these investments you know, that we've asked the public to make are, are really returning what, uh, what we need. There's a question about whether public uh, programs are the places in which these uh, investments ought to be made. So, uh, but more importantly, we're serving lots of kids now. And those kids are having one, one shot at getting through, you know, the systems that we're providing to them. So if we don't do the best by them now, um, they, don't, they don't get to reap any of those benefits later. So it's really, you know, I think in many ways uh, a return to why we were doing this in the first place. You know, why, why we all get involved in this in the first place is to ensure that those kids that are, that are moving through these programs that need, desperately need, the opportunities that we intend to be providing to them in these programs, that we make sure we do good by them. So um, 
with that in mind, um, I, I couldn't be more honored uh, to introduce to you uh, Derek Little, um, who, who, um, is, um, who embodies this work in, in all sorts of uh, directions, uh, a former Broad Fellow, former uh, state um, uh, staffer in Louisiana in early childhood, uh, and now the, uh, the deputy uh, superintendent here for early childhood uh, in, uh, in Dallas ISD. So I am going to turn the podium over uh, to Derek, and uh, he's going to share with you a bit about his perspective on the, on the work that you are doing and the work that he's doing, and how this, um, I think, is, is really uh, compelling for us to be uh, carrying forward as we think about uh, advancing the work uh, nationally and beyond. So thanks all very much. Hope you enjoy the rest of your time. Thanks, Tom. Well, good afternoon, folks. Happy lunch. Hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, certainly don't stop eating on my account. I'm a hungry guy all the time, so uh, keep going. As uh, Bob mentioned, I had the good pleasure to be in Louisiana at a time of you know, true sort of overhaul and reform, which you heard a little bit yesterday uh, about from Sorrentha and Paula. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit from my perspective and some lessons learned there that I think are informing the work that we have going on now in Dallas ISD. But I actually want to spend most of the time today talking to you about you know, why I think this work really matters and use one of our students to help uh, portray that story. But first, just want to start with a little clip that as we think about systems change, uh, I think it becomes really important to keep some of these thoughts in mind. Psychologists know that there are two systems in our brains, the rational system and the emotional system. Jonathan Haidt, who's a psychologist at NYU, came up with a great analogy for these two systems. He said, think of your brain as a human rider atop an elephant. The rider represents the rational system. That's the part of us that plans and problem solves. The rider might do some analyzing and decide, hey, I want to go that way. But it's the elephant representing the emotional system that provides the power for the journey. The rider can try to lead the elephant or drag the elephant, but if these two ever disagree, who would you bet on? The elephant has a six ton weight advantage, and it's exactly that power imbalance that makes adopting new behaviors very hard. If you want this duo to head a new direction, you also need to think about the path, which represents the external environment. This duo is more likely to complete a journey if you can shorten the distance and remove any obstacles in their way. So bottom line, if you want to lead change, you've got to do three things. Give direction to the rider, knowledge of how to get to the destination. You've got to motivate the elephant, which means tapping into emotion. And finally, you need to shape the path to allow for easy progress. That's how change happens. We'll pass those applause along to whoever made that video. Uh, but I think it, it does a really good job of capturing uh, three things that have certainly been important to the work that the team is still doing in Louisiana and I think is critically important to the work we're trying to do in Dallas ISD. Um, they, they make a, a point in the video that change is really hard and it's really emotional and I think as we think about the work related to class or building stronger relationships between teachers and students um, that requires adults to change the way they think about what they're going to do in that classroom every day. It requires us as system level leaders, be it a child care director, a Head Start director, or a school principal, or our district staff member, to change the way we think about our work. But where I think we often um, misstep is actually in the last two places. How do we keep people motivated to endure that change? How do we keep them excited and engaged and still focused on where we're trying to go? And the third thing, I think, is where government does a really bad job, and I work for government and have my whole life, 
but we don't do a great job of clearing the path for people. And in many ways, we actually make it more difficult for them to get to where we want to go. So I want to talk a little bit about some experiences I've had in the past few years that I think relates to all of this. So yes, I was in Louisiana. I'm from Louisiana. I miss Louisiana. I love Louisiana. Um, but I'm learning to be a Texan. Uh, so <laughs> I know, right? You're not going to like what I say next, though. So, <laughs> growing up in Louisiana, there was always a truth for me. We would look next door to Mississippi, and we would look next door to Texas, and we'd say, we're all right in Louisiana. We don't need to go to either of those two places. <laughs> and somehow, uh, life, thankfully, has not taken me to Mississippi. Uh, but it, it has taken me to uh, Texas. <laughs> friendly love, folks, friendly love. Uh, our former lieutenant governor in Louisiana actually does, gives a great talk called Why Louisiana Ain't Mississippi, and it's actually not about Mississippi at all, but I think it embodies how much we are proud to be Louisianians. Uh, but again, I am, I am very much learning the Texas Pledge. I am trying to acculturate myself as much as possible, but it's really hard when it comes to food. <laughs> And I am already pitching, and now that I'm up here and nobody can make me be quiet, Interact 2018 should be in New Orleans next year. Because uh, we could have crawfish and shrimp and gumbo. But my advice to you in Texas, there is obviously great Tex-Mex and barbecue, and you probably have experienced that. But there is amazing Thai food in Texas. It has been like the oddest thing to me, but that's, that's what I live on now, since I don't get good seafood. But let's start with Louisiana. Five years ago, Saritha mentioned that yesterday, and I was like, wow, it was five years ago. In 2012, the legislature in Louisiana started to take note of what was happening in the state, particularly in terms of how few children were coming to kindergarten, sort of quote unquote, uh, ready for school. Uh, the data that existed was pretty bad. The legislature and the governor at the time said, we want to change this. They were looking at what was probably an incorrect amount of money, but they're like, we're spending over a billion dollars in the early childhood system. We're like, no, you're not. It's not going anywhere to classrooms. Uh, but there was money being spent in the state and not a lot of good outcomes to show for it. So the legislature basically unanimously, which is not something that the Louisiana legislature often does, uh, passed a bill which the Louisiana folks will know of as Act 3. But that bill really set out to change the face of the early childhood landscape in the state. And one of the things that, that I, I miss a lot about the work in Louisiana, and I think they're doing it really well, is they're thinking about it not just in public preschool, but across the entire birth to five continuum. So you know, childcare, early Head Start, Head Start, public schools, all of those are, are now working together. But it didn't start there. Uh, so I was actually in a different part of Louisiana in 2012, watching our, our public TV channel do some public forum, uh, and they were talking about three major pieces of legislation that the legislature passed in 2012, one of them which was this early childhood bill. I was like, oh, that sounds great. I was working as a CFO at a high school at the time, and little did I know that nine months later, I would be in the office with about four other people trying to answer the question, okay, now we have this piece of legislation which in four years requires people to do things, how do we get them from where we are now? Which was a very fragmented system. Uh, people were competitive, they did not work well together, and Louisiana had created that type of environment. Uh, as the state rolled out more and more publicly funded pre-K pre in schools, obviously that had impacts to Head Start programs into childcare centers. Uh, the state provided funding to public schools, and in some cases to childcare providers through a non-public school, uh, program, uh, but the way childcare was funded compared to how Head Start was funded compared to how public preschool was funded was all over the map. So we had both a really nasty puzzle on one side and a blank sheet of paper on the other. And thankfully, through amazing leadership that we had in the department and are still there, uh, we tried to do a lot of listening. And so the state rolled out this approach to say, we're sitting in 2013, we have a mandate from the legislature by the time we get to the 2016 school year to have all this figured out and fully implemented, and we will humbly say we don't quite know how to make that happen. Uh, and we know, and if any of you have ever driven through Louisiana, it is not the same place everywhere you go. The state is really vastly different uh, culturally, geographically, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on 
in what is a really interesting place to, to live and work. Uh, so knowing that we needed to take this messy picture of childcare Head Start and schools doing things very differently, families really had no clue where to enroll their child if they were looking for a quality program. You obviously, you go off word of mouth, you talk to people, you go to where you went as a kid, where your mom sent you, but we couldn't as a state promise to families that they were gonna get a good experience based on where they chose to enroll their child. It was also inordinately difficult to actually enroll your kid in one of these programs. You may have to fill out the same packet of paper at every place you went, and it just became a burden on many families who needed these services uh, the most. So a lot of the initial work in Louisiana and the, the Jefferson folks were huge partners in this, along with many other communities throughout the state. Um, we, we put out an RFP, as government also likes to do, and said, okay, we're gonna give you a little bit of money. That's part of the motivate thing. Uh, it wasn't enough probably to keep folks motivated, but it got people interested. We'll give you a little bit of money we're gonna require you to use a new child assessment. We're not gonna tell you what it is because we don't know yet. <laughs> and we're gonna do this other thing where we sort of assess your classrooms, but it's really not an assessment and we're not gonna talk to you about that yet either because we're not ready to do it, but let's go. <laughs> and it worked, amazingly it worked. And I think to Bob's point and, and to comments that Rebecca made this morning, like this room I think is, is the tip of the iceberg in terms of how many people exist throughout the country that have a passion for making kids' lives better and for doing that through real support to teachers and leaders on the ground. And so it was amazing to me and a testament I think to uh, how much early learning leaders had just sort of been untapped throughout the years because these people were ready to get to work even though the path wasn't totally clear. Uh, they were, were ready to explore and innovate and change the picture from people not working together to one where people did work together. So the basic expectation for uh, how we set about the system change that is still underway in Louisiana is by requiring people to come together as a community. I use the word require specifically, like it is now truly a requirement. If you provide publicly funded care, regardless of the type of provider you are, you have to be part of what the state calls a community network. Because we believed in Louisiana, and I think they're showing it to be true, that teachers will have more consistency and understanding on what's expected across their community. You can leverage more supports. Head Start actually is a huge uh, organization that can provide a lot of support to communities if you just sit down and talk to one another about what you can do through TNTA, what you've learned by using class for all these years if a school system or a set of childcare providers is new to it. And that became an anchor uh, in many places uh, for the work. The other thing that became important is uh, a little bit on how families access the services. So you heard a little bit yesterday about performance profiles, and I remember a lot of horror stories on the conversations on how do we call something that truly is a report card, something other than a report card, uh, because every provider had to get one, and it was supposed to be a signal to families on how things are going, and if they decide to enroll their precious little boy or girl at that school Head Start or Child Care Center, what will it mean? The other difficulty, and I think Louisiana put a big stake in the ground by saying the only factor that is going to determine the rating on that performance profile is how your teachers do or your classrooms do on class. We're going to put those stakes on it and we're going to expect you to do your own observations. It just doesn't make sense on the surface probably. But it's working because what it did, I think what you heard about yesterday morning is it created an investment. That became the lasting motivation for people because yes, they got a little funding in the beginning to start the work, they got some support initially, and then thanks to Bob and Bridget and the whole team now at Teachstone for creating something that is truly amazing at giving people a pathway to think about uh, the quality of, of what goes on in a classroom and the importance of teachers and students building true authentic relationships together. So everybody in a community and everybody in the state of Louisiana being able to align on that and I think see the difference that it makes even in a short amount of time 
is hopefully what will keep all of those communities motivated moving forward because now there is a clear anchor uh, to the work even though there's still lots of uh, controversy over the one, one rating aspect to those performance profiles, it did at least provide focus. I also am hopeful and think that it's starting to provide focus for families because you no longer have to navigate if somebody's a star rated provider over here or they're an A through F school rating over here or maybe you just open and we have no idea how you're performing. All of that is coming into more coherence uh, as well and uh, there, there are two folks here from the State Department that I would suggest you speak to, and they're, they're all sitting over there with the Louisiana table. But they've done a lot of work, uh, and Bob mentioned this a little bit, thinking about the whole system. And some of this has come into play even in the last year since I've been gone. But how do we provide a real incentive to families? How many in the room are associated with Head Start? Wow. How many of you are a traditional child care provider? One, two. I think that says a lot. It says a lot that childcare is probably the most disadvantaged player at the table in this work. For all of you who raise your hands at Head Start, you need to be thankful, I think, if I can pontificate for a minute, about two things. You need to be thankful that um, you have clear expectations from the federal government, even though they may be difficult and frustrating at times, there are clear expectations. And your funding, as much as you may not want to admit it, is better than any childcare system receives in probably the entire country. But we have so many families that have to choose childcare, and this will connect to something I'm talking about in Dallas right now. But Head Starts like schools most often provide some portion of the full workday of care, and we saw this in Louisiana community by community. We had some half-day Head Start programs, Great, that serves a purpose for some families. We had full school day Head Start and school programs. That serves a different purpose. Uh, but for a lot of people, you have to have six to six or 6.30 to seven or, or some other type of system. So the more I think we have communities thinking about this entire ecosystem of work, how funding plays into that and how parents have to write a check to a childcare center and how that really hurts for most of the families that we're serving because they're already low income or they're really low income or they're having to work multiple jobs, that becomes a real burden, not only for that family, but for our entire educational system in a community. And Louisiana has done some good work and, and I would suggest that you follow up on it as proxies for what potentially can happen in your state on changing the way childcare is funded a little bit uh, at the parent level and at the provider level. There's work to be done and there's never enough money uh, but we have to recognize that the vast majority of our families uh, need additional support and they need quality uh, places. The other thing and the last thing I'll say about Louisiana is um, obviously the work that most of us do every day are for teachers that who already work with our organizations. But there's a whole bunch of people that want to be teachers out there in a prep program, a community college, doing something else right now and thinking about alternative certification. And Louisiana is doing some incredible work to make sure that their preparation prior to entering the classroom is the best it can be. Because certainly for us in Dallas, and, and I'll chat about this, and probably for you, uh, you get people who love children or who want to make a difference, but a lot of times they don't know how to do that. And as much as we can prevent and repair that on the front end, the easier our work will be on the back end and the higher quality results we'll see. So that's a little nugget about Louisiana. Some of the same lessons learned are translating into our work in Dallas ISD. The difference here though is we're not technically thinking about this from birth to five, even though we're pushing the envelope for a district trying to do that as much as we can, but we're actually thinking about it pre-K three to second grade. Um, so we sort of scaled the pipeline up a little bit thinking about the traditional sort of birth to eight spectrum. So there are two clear goals. Um, that every time I have to sit in front of our board and answer questions, it's about these two things. How many of our kids are ready for kindergarten? We'll leave the assessment conversation aside for another day. And how many are reading on grade level? Because we know that when they enter third grade, if they're not reading on grade level, we're gonna have a lot of challenges uh, as a system in that child. And we're thinking about achieving that through four ways. So the story's gonna start to sound a little similar to you. How can we enroll more families into our pre-K programs? 
we thankfully in Dallas ISD uh, have a whole bunch of classrooms, but we have a whole bunch of classrooms in community-based settings. We have joint uh, efforts with Head Start and Child Cares in the city, it's where we have a Dallas ISD teacher in that classroom, our curriculum, our coaching support, et cetera. But families got to choose the place that worked best for them. Uh, but we right now are serving about 82% of all four-year-olds that could qualify for pre-K in Dallas, and we're proud of that. Uh, from last year to this year, we had over an additional 1,000 kids enroll in our pre-K program, which is a huge growth, and we want to keep that moving forward. For our three-year-olds, though, we're at about 17%. We offer a half-day pre-K program. That's not going to work for everybody. So we're now trying to think about how do we work with other community providers uh, to allow families to have a quality three-year-old experience, but still get the full care and education that they need for the entire day. And that work's not easy, but it's important because that's the only way we're going to reach the other roughly 80% of our three-year-olds. The second thing up there I think is really interesting and we probably don't think enough about, even in, in Dallas ISD for our team, but how do we help parents, one, understand the importance of enrolling their child in a quality place, two, knowing how to navigate the system to actually do that, and three, to talk to other people about it so that this message gets out there that, no, this is not babysitting. There is real stuff happening here. Your child will have a fundamentally different path by going through a quality early learning program. So how do we help you with all the challenges or opportunities you have as a family understand that? So it's not just us creating classrooms and saying, please come, but families start knocking on our door saying, I am demanding that you provide a quality experience for my child, and here's what I need. And so the demand issue is something that I think we, as a collective, could think more about. The quality is obviously what we've been talking about for the last day and a half. How do we take the classrooms that we have and create the highest quality environment that we can for the children that we serve, and what role does class play in, in that? In Louisiana, it played a huge role for us in Dallas ISD. It also plays a central role. Um, I like the way Bob described sort of bolting things together. We're struggling with that a lot. How do you bolt all the things that teachers and principals and, and folks have to do? But how do we keep at the center of that effort this notion that how you work with each other, how you interact with each other, and the language that class provides as the core of what we're thinking about? And then finally, we're, we're thinking about things outside of the classroom as well. So as we think about the birth to eight spectrum, you know, we, we have this little chart that we show folks that you know, kids are with us for seven or eight hours a day. There's a whole nother 14-ish you know, hours, 15 hours that they're somewhere else. How do we not dictate what happens in those hours but support a positive experience? So for families who want to uh, pursue a GED or take ESL classes or have better skills reading to their kid at home, how can we help facilitate all of that, even if we aren't directly providing those services. So our scale is not small, which makes this really exciting. For pre-K in Dallas ISD, we have 11,500 kids enrolled right now at about 600 classrooms. 100 of those 600 classrooms are at community-based locations, so in Child Care or Head Start. We are very fortunate that our board it may have been due to Bob's visit a few years ago, uh, but our board has made a commitment to invest in early learning. So we get a blank check, a sizable blank check every year to say, how can you continue to move the ball forward with improving quality pre-K to second grade? That's the only reason we can say we have 35 coaches to support pre-K work. If you do the quick math, though, you start to realize some, some realities here. 35 coaches across 600 classrooms, it's a big ratio. Our coaches on average have 18 to 20 classrooms each. To my point earlier, we have teachers who are very invested in the work and want to make a difference but don't always have the specific skills they need to do that. How does an individual coach dedicate his or her time across a week to make a difference in 18 to 20 classrooms? Uh, if you were in the session that we did with SMU yesterday, you heard me make the point that from northern point of Dallas to the southern point of Dallas is at least an hour and a half drive. So how do we think about this support geographically across all of these places? Because we don't want just 
20 children in a classroom to have a great experience. We want 11,500 children in every classroom to have a great experience. And so we are struggling and open to advice, and hopefully you can give me some in a few minutes, on how do we think more creatively and smartly about how we connect our coaches to all of those classrooms and really make a difference for all of those kids. In our K2 side, this is the first year we're using class K2. Second year for pre-K, first year for K2. Total, we have 34,000 kids in kindergarten to second grade in Dallas ISD and about 2,400 classrooms. Only 500 of those, however, are receiving coaching support. You see our number smaller here. That's where we have to scale over time. So we can't spread 25 coaches over 2,400 classrooms, so we had to limit it to a certain number of schools. Uh, thankfully, if a school's involved, they're involved pre-K to second grade. But our district is organized by feeder pattern, meaning where you're gonna go to elementary school, middle school, and high school, that creates sort of a geographical boundary in the city. Not every school and every feeder pattern is involved, which starts to create gaps. We have like this Swiss cheese effect and how principals talk to each other, and most of them wanna talk about teacher evaluation and state accountability, and we're like, hey, there's some other stuff going on here in K2, but they aren't all involved in the same work. So that's also one of our challenges as we think about scaling the system change moving forward, while still honoring the urgency, as Bob mentioned before, that there are kids in the classroom right now that we want to have a positive impact on. I wanna show another quick clip for some kids in our pre-K classroom that I think embodies a piece of the work. What, what is your favorite thing about pre-K? My favorite thing is you What, what's your favorite thing to learn in pre-K? Well, my favorite thing is to learn about petting fish, eggs, chicks, caterpillars, and that no. that's it. I like to eat. Where are you from? Egypt. You're from Egypt. Now you live here in Dallas? And so on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you like pre-K? 11. What is your favorite thing about pre-K? Play basketball. Now, who's there? Me. Me who? A cow. A cow? You're a cow? Cow who? Cow... Elmo. Cow Elmo? What does Cal Elmo say? Hello. <laughs> We use that clip as a promotional little thing in our, our pre-K roundup that's going on right now. But I like it a lot because it signals a few things to me about the work that we're doing. When those kids were asked, what do you like most about pre-K, none of them talked about traditional school things. Like they're not like, I like to come sit at my desk every day and like work on a worksheet. <laughs> no, they were like, I like to run, jump, and play every day. Uh, and the Cal Elmo thing is just brilliant. And I think it also embodies a lot of things that class is looking for. The, the gentleman, Gene, is in our media team, and he did something beautiful. He kept going with that child, and he got to the place where there is now a Cal Elmo um, joke that's sort of spanning Dallas because of this little video. <laughs> Teachers generally, in my opinion, aren't oriented to do that, though. They have a mission. What's your favorite thing about pre-K? Answer the question move on to the next kid. What's your favorite thing about pre-K? Answer the question and move on. So I think part of what we're trying to do is get folks to a place where obviously as, as class wants as well, that we can be more organic in the learning while still keeping the objective out there for where do we need children to be at the end of the year along the way. This is just a quick snapshot of our two-year data with class and pre-K. The dark uh, bars are teachers who have been consistent across all four observation periods. So we have a partnership with Southern Methodist University to do these observations. So they go out once in the fall and once in the spring to every classroom and report the data to us, which guides the coaching that we do. Uh, one of the things I love about this is we are making progress. Like 
across emotional support and classroom organization, trend lines are pretty steep. Uh, teachers who have been in the same classroom, in the same grade level for the entire period are doing better than those who started later. One of our huge challenges, as probably many of you in a district context face, is we will cycle teachers across the pre-K to five uh, grade span probably far too often. So they might teach pre-K this year, second grade next year, fourth grade the year after that, and then back to pre-K. But we're getting data now to show that that consistency really pays off. It also shows us that we got a lot of work to do, right? These are all anchored around the sort of thresholds of 5, 5, and 3.25 for instructional support. But more than half of our classrooms are not even at a 3.25 in instructional support. So this is our path moving forward. How do we continue to keep a really great classroom environment in place while increasing performance on the more academic sides of the work? Gonna, whoops, sorry about that. In the last few minutes, I want to show one other clip um, and then talk about not so much the academic purpose of this work, but what I think is the social justice purpose of this work, and then we'll end it there. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. So this is Caleb. Caleb is a pre-K-4 student in one of the lowest performing schools in our district. If you drove in the neighborhood to where Caleb goes to school, you'd be like, oh my goodness, this is not an exciting place to be. His school was not an exciting place to be five months ago either. Uh, as we all know, leadership matters a lot. You'd walk in the school and you would hear things you didn't want to hear in an elementary school. You'd hear teachers being more aggressive than you want teachers to ever be with students. But that's where Caleb had to go to school. Caleb thankfully had a really great pre-K teacher and really great support, uh, coaching support from our team. And you probably can't see it, but Caleb had just sort of written out his ABCs and uppercase and lowercase letters on the paper and then he started singing them. And then Udity, the little girl, was like, what are you doing? She would not talk almost the whole time. I sat down with Caleb and was having a little conversation with him, and she was just checking me out, very quietly observing and, and not really interested. She finally opened up at the end, but Caleb said, oh, don't worry, Udity's not going to talk to you. <laughs> it's like, all right, thank you for the heads up. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but he, however, was very talkative. And so, Caleb embodies for me why we have to keep doing what we're all doing and probably why we have to try to do it faster and stronger and better than what we're doing right now. Because a lot of students from Caleb's school will end up here. He is at a school that is probably 99% African American, one of the poorest places in Dallas, and far too many of their kids ride that bus. It starts out yellow and it ends up white. Caleb can't be a kid on that trajectory. We also know, and many of you have probably done some work around this, that you know, Caleb and a lot of other students at his school are impacted by adverse childhood experiences. I'm sitting there talking to Caleb that day and he randomly, just off the cuff, was like, my dad can't come home anymore. Okay, so I say, all right, Caleb, that's fine. You know, what's going on? Well, he stole something from our house and mom won't let him come back. That's just one of these boxes. What else will Caleb check off? What else will the other 20 kids in Caleb's pre-K class be able to check off? And how does that magnify, again, across this school, which is persistently underperforming, super high poverty school, in what really feels like a wasteland when you're driving this part of Dallas? And so we spend a lot of time in the district talking about literacy gains and talking about getting kids ready for kindergarten and ready for third grade. What I want us to spend more time talking about and what I want all of you to spend more time talking about in your context is how do we make a difference here? How do we use class as an anchor to build attachments with kids, which becomes the solution to these adverse childhood experiences? All of you who raised your hands with Head Start, your kids are either in poverty they're special ed or they're just above the cusp. They too check off a lot of these boxes. 
the whole state of Louisiana practically checks off a lot of these boxes. I grew up in a situation that checked off a lot of those boxes as a kid. So our role of making sure that teachers are ready to build those relationships and thinking about, you've probably seen this cartoon, how do we as systems leader, I don't think do this. I think this is the wrong way to think about the cartoon and it's been updated. But recognize that the situation is actually where Caleb's buried in the ground if Caleb can't have a great kindergarten teacher followed by a great first grade teacher followed by a great second grade teacher, he might be back on that bus that's gonna turn white one day. So how do we acknowledge this reality and rather than just approaching it from an equity standpoint, say we gotta give Caleb a whole new path. We have gotta recognize that there's a lot of emotions at play, there's a lot of elephants that we've gotta push, pull, tug, do something with at the teacher level, at the administrator level, at the community level but we need Caleb to be able to walk freely for the next 12 years that he's in school. And hopefully the work that we're doing now in Dallas ISD recognizes something I wrote to my wife recently. We were foster parents in Louisiana. Had a really hard time on the year anniversary of the last placement that we had, sort of handling those emotions. But here's what I told her and what I think about our work. We each have to give pieces of our hearts to the teachers and kids that we serve you won't run out of pieces because somebody's gonna be giving some to you along the way. But if we can give enough pieces of our love to Caleb and to every other student in the classroom and to the teachers that we serve, I think we'll have fewer buses turning white, we'll have more elephants and little brains who are moving down the path, uh, and we will certainly be impacting the hundreds of thousands of kids that we all want to impact. So thank you. <laughs>